A Gulfstream II business jet slices through the air in a manner no executive aircraft was ever designed to fly. Its flaps are lifted upward instead of down. Its thrust reversers, never meant to deploy in flight, are fully engaged. The sleek jet banks into an impossibly steep descent, plummeting at a 20-degree angle with no sky visible through the narrow cockpit windows. Only Earth fills the view. The aircraft shudders and protests. The stick grows heavy in the pilot's hands. At 280 knots, it feels like 200,000 pounds of unaerodynamic aircraft are fighting back. The runway, a distant strip of concrete, grows larger with each passing second. A few feet above the ground, a light blinks. The instructor flips a switch. Normal flight resumes as the aircraft climbs back into the sky. They do it again and again, a thousand times. Because that's how you learn to land the flying brick. The Space Shuttle Question In the late 1970s, NASA engineers and planners were in the midst of finalizing the operational profile for its newest orbital vehicle, the Space Shuttle, the world's first reusable spacecraft in history, a system that blended rocket propulsion, thermal protection, and aerodynamic recovery into a single integrated vehicle. Despite its high public profile, this first-of-its-kind model introduced significant technical challenges for its engineers and flight crews, especially regarding the final descent and landing. During a mission, the Space Shuttle launched vertically atop solid rocket boosters. However, upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the spacecraft glided completely unpowered toward a high-speed runway landing. With no automated systems to guide it, no backup controls, just manual input, the pilots had to fly the final descent from over 80,000 feet at Mach 1.5, using only aerodynamic surfaces to steer a massive, falling spacecraft toward a precise touchdown point. With no fuel reserves for approach corrections and no go-around capability, the pilot only had one chance for either success or an all-out catastrophe. From the very beginning, NASA scientists understood that landing a 200,000-pound unpowered spacecraft would require an entirely new kind of training. According to a 2007 article by the service, written with the input of research pilot Jack Tripp Nickel and flight simulations engineer Allison Hickey, quote, the shuttle has the flying characteristics of brick, basically, with wings. Though NASA's simulation systems had evolved steadily since the Apollo era, even the most advanced ground-based trainers had their limits. Simulators could replicate displays, procedures, and control logic. Still, the screen simply couldn't reproduce the physical forces involved in landing a vehicle at the shuttle and the subtle control needed to stabilize it. Somewhere in the late stages of shuttle development, NASA recognized it would need an entirely separate flight training platform that behaved like a spacecraft during crucial and final minutes of flight. They set out to create one. The Modifications In 1976, that niche requirement became a program of its own, and NASA engineers began work on converting the Grumman Gulfstream II civilian business jet into a high-performance descent trainer for astronaut use. Developed in the early 1960s, the Gulfstream II was a twin-engine jet designed for long-range executive travel. Powered by two Rolls-Royce Spey turbofan engines mounted at the rear fuselage, the swept-wing Gulfstream II cruised at over 530 miles per hour, with a range of approximately 2,625 miles. Built for reliability and endurance, the Gulfstream II quickly became one of the premier corporate aircraft of its class, and eventually the testbed for something far more demanding. Though reliable, fast, and light on the controls, the stock model of the stock Gulfstream II bore no resemblance to the aerodynamics of the space shuttle. To convert it into a viable training platform, NASA engineers had to fundamentally alter how the aircraft behaved, inside and out. The result was a small four-aircraft fleet of the heavily modified Gulfstream IIs, designated as Shuttle Training Aircraft, or STAs. One of the very first priorities of the project was reinforcing the airframe. During training, the STA would be flown through steep, high-speed approaches, putting far more stress on the structure than the Gulfstream II was ever designed to absorb. Descent angles would reach 20 degrees, well beyond standard jetliner maneuvers, producing higher aerodynamic loads and requiring specific structural upgrades throughout the wings and fuselage to maintain control authority and flight safety across repeated drills. 
flight control systems came next in line. Because the aircraft's natural handling had to be overridden, engineers integrated a custom and state-of-the-art digital fly-by-wire system that could switch the jet into a shuttle-like performance mode. Named the Advanced Digital Avionics System, or ADAS, once active, the main landing gear came down mid-flight, the thrust reversers deployed, and the flaps deflected upward instead of down, all to strip away lift and force the jet into the kind of unstable descent the orbiter faced on re-entry. In addition to the outside changes, nearly everything on the left side of the cockpit was rebuilt. The astronaut flew from a station modeled directly after the shuttle's flight deck, complete with a rotational hand controller, heads-up display, and digital multifunction screens, space to match the orbiter's instrument layout. To recreate the landing as best as possible, even the window frames were reshaped to replicate the narrow view from the shuttle cockpit. Meanwhile, the instructor pilot, located on the right seat, retained standard controls and displays, allowing them to manage the aircraft before and after simulation mode or step in during emergency procedures. The result was a platform that could physically simulate one of the most demanding phases of shuttle flight. How to land a flying brick. Initial flight testing of the shuttle training aircraft began in the late 1970s, with NASA's first modified Gulfstream II operating out of Ellington Field near Houston, Texas. A typical STA run didn't start at the runway, but with a climb to 37,000 feet. The aircraft leveled off and banked into position parallel to the landing strip, miles out, perfectly aligned, just like the shuttle would be during re-entry. At altitude, the instructor activated the ADAS, and the normally smooth-handling Gulfstream became twitchy and unstable. Once the aircraft was switched into simulation mode, the astronaut in the left seat took over. From then on, they flew high, fast, and without engine power. The descent demanded full concentration. The astronaut had to guide the aircraft through a wide, sweeping 180-degree turn around the landing site, carefully following each segment of the shuttle's real approach path, downwind, base, and final. During this time, there was no autopilot, no fly-by-wire assistance, and no computer smoothing things out. Only the pilot, the stick, and a rapidly changing set of instruments demanding constant attention. At 20,000 feet, the jet was already moving at 280 knots, and by 12,000 feet, the astronaut started the final approach, making the nose drop into a steep 20-degree dive, far steeper and faster than any commercial airliner. This wasn't a gentle glide down like a regular jet landing. Instead, the ground came up fast, the controls grew heavy, and the instruments moved quickly. At 1,800 feet, the astronaut had just one shot to pull the aircraft out of its dive, level off into a shallow three-degree glide, and hold it steady all the way to the runway. Pulling too early would send the aircraft floating past the touchdown point. Too late, and they'd crash into the ground. The nose gears stayed up throughout the approach, since it couldn't handle the stress of the steep descent. But the astronaut flew as if it were already down, mimicking how the actual shuttle behaved in those final seconds. Then, at just 300 feet above the runway, the instructor hit the switch to lower it, time to perfectly match the exact point it would deploy during an actual shuttle landing. The simulation ended when the pilot's eyes hit 32 feet above the runway, the same exact height as the shuttle's cockpit during touchdown. At that point, a small light on the panel took control, climbed back to altitude, and set up to do it all over again and again, sometimes up to a dozen times a day. Over time, while Ellington remained the primary training base, Missions were also conducted at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Edwards Air Force Base in California, and occasionally White Sands in New Mexico, depending on weather, mission schedules, or emergency landing site rehearsals. Though the shuttle orbiter had no go-arounds and no second chances, the shuttle training aircraft gave every pilot a chance to get it right. There was only one incident in the aircraft's four decades of records. On December 3, 2003, one of NASA's modified Gulfstream II shuttle training aircraft was in the middle of a routine flight near Florida's space coast. Everything was standard until the aircraft was on final approach, descending through 13,000 feet when cockpit instruments flagged a fault in one of the thrust reversers. Though the STA touched down safely, without incident for anyone in the three-person crew, a post-flight inspection revealed a shocking truth. One of the engine thrust reversers, 
measuring five feet long, four feet across, and weighing nearly 600 pounds, was gone, likely breaking off from the aircraft mid-flight without anyone noticing it. Afterward, specialized divers located the missing hardware at the bottom of a nearby river, and the cause was traced to a failed bolt that had allowed the component to break free. The Results Completed in the late 1970s and first launched in 1981, the Space Shuttle became NASA's flagship orbital vehicle for the next 30 years. Across 135 missions, the Shuttle deployed satellites, supported scientific research, and helped build the International Space Station, establishing the foundation for sustained human presence in space. But none of it could have happened without a way to bring the crew home safely. The Gulfstream STA played a central role in solving that problem. After logging thousands of hours and supporting 946 training days, one of the aircraft made its final landing at Rick Husband Amarillo International Airport on September 21, 2011, and all remaining STAs were officially retired later that year. Though still airworthy, NASA chose not to repurpose them. Today, although the space shuttle is grounded and the era of late 20th century spaceflight has come to a close, the four tiny aircraft that taught its pilots how to land are on display in museums across the country, forever preserved as pieces of a closed chapter in American spaceflight. From the outside, these models continue to look like executive jets, but inside and in the air, they were anything but. In reality, these four modified aircraft completed tens of thousands of simulated descents, flying in every imaginable condition giving astronauts from different decades the only real-world chance to practice landing a vehicle that couldn't be flown until it came back from space. With every shuttle commander being required to complete at least 1,000 of those approaches, each and every one of those STA flights made the real thing just a little less uncertain. <laughs>